want to say thanks for all to um, all of you for turning up and as big thanks for uh, to Bronwyn and Lance for organizing this and inviting me on in the first place. So we're finally here. So look, let's kick off. I'll just share my screen. There it is there. Uh, no, we don't want that one. Sorry, folks. Technical glitch. And, and you please utilize the chat box for questions. Um, we will have questions and answers after, but we'll curate during the, the, the presentation. Lovely. You can all see that title page. Yes. Yep, we're all good. Okay, good. Just making sure we're on track. Okay, well, look, as I said before, look, thanks for uh, inviting me on. But before I start the talk, I'd really just like to um, uh, acknowledge country. So myself and, and UQ acknowledge the traditional owners and their custodianship of the lands on which we meet and also the lands on which my research is conducted. Uh, we'd like to pay our respects to their ancestors and their descendants who continue cultural and spiritual connections to the country. And obviously we recognise their valuable contributions to the Australian and global societies. Um, so uh, let's get into the talk. So uh, first thing I want to point out is that tonight's talk will be a, a sort of a bit of a, a debunking of some of some myths um, uh, about pterosaurs in general, and also talking ultimately about the new dis the, the new uh, discovery that our research kind of led to. So um, on a wing and a prayer, it's kind of appropriate coming from a background. So I'm currently a PhD candidate at UQ um, and I had never worked with pterosaurs uh, coming into the PhD. In fact, I'd never actually worked with vertebrates in general. So my research up until then uh, included these frond looking plants, animals, organisms, from the Cambrian era. So we're talking closer to sort of 440 million years ago. So that was my background. And I basically heard about some, some fossils that were in a little museum in the middle of Queensland um, and was told no one's ever looked at them. It'd probably make a good PhD project. They're probably pterosaurs. And me being rather naive with uh, any vertebrate, I'm like, yeah, well, that sounds like a great idea. I know what pterosaurs are. It sounds like a wonderful project. Um, and then I started and realised just how little we know, um, and hence, hence the title. So, uh, chasing Australia's elusive pterosaurs. So, let's start properly now. The first thing you'll notice in this title slide is that I belong or I'm affiliated with the. Um, the dinosaur lab at UQ. So let's get this out of the way. So first of all, there are a lot of, uh, there is a perpetuating myth and it's, and uh, a lot of people sort of, you know, perpetuate it, that, that pterosaurs are dinosaurs. Um, and it's not helped by the fact that I come from the dinosaur lab. So the part, the first part of my talk, I just want to basically try and you know, dispel two common myths about pterosaurs. The first one is that pterosaurs are simply flying dinosaurs. And the second one is that the terms pterosaur or pterodactyl are interchangeable and mean the same things, okay? So let's start with the first myth. So pterosaurs are flying dinosaurs. Okay, so as a child, we're all conditioned to, when we're introduced to dinosaurs, and we're, you know, there's sort of these reading cards you've got, that's a picture from a, um, I think it's a puzzle, the, the top of a, a puzzle box. Um, and we're told that, you know, uh, pterosaurs belong with the dinosaurs and they are flying dinosaurs with wings, essentially. Um, and that's what we're taught as kids. And that kind of sticks with us all the way until we start PhDs. And it's not helped by the fact that the media also jump on board. And I'll show you two examples, real examples from the media. Uh, the one on the left is not my research. It was a colleague of mine who's also uh, working on uh, Australian pterosaurs. And it says they're obviously the giant flying dinosaur. The media article on the right there is actually from, uh, from my research. And again, it refers to it as a giant flying uh, dinosaur. Okay. so. Let's go on. So basically, they are not um, dinosaurs. So why are pterosaurs not dinosaurs? Well, let's go back to the tree. 
this is just showing a little part of the uh, reptilian tree. So starting with archosaurs. So both dinosaurs and pterosaurs, as, as you probably know, are referred to in a big group called archosaurs. And they're also united by the fact that they have very, very similar feet. Um, and that is the little node, the second one up there, that's Ave Meditarsalia. And that just simply refers to that they have their feet, their foot bones or their feet bones are very bird-like. And, um, and that makes sense because they are very, very similar. But after that, you can see that pterosaurs and the dinosauria or the dinosaurs, they split and they don't come together again. So simply looking at that tree, you can see that pterosaurs are over here and dinosaurs, of course, are over here. So what's the difference? OK, so I'm going to talk a little bit about anatomy now. So dinosaurs, you've got two major groups, the Sauritians and the, uh, the um, Onithorishians. And they are simply divided by what their hips look like, okay? So dinosaur hips, you have essentially two major groups, okay? You have the lizard hips, which includes your sort of big sauropods, you know, your brachiosaurs, your T-Rex, things like that. And then you have the, um, the onishias, and they are more bird-like, and they, they belong to your sort of your triceratops, your stegosaurus, things like that. So that divides the two dinosaur clades. Then we bring in a pterosaur hip bone and you can see that it is remarkably different. Now, the one thing that does unite dinosaur hips is this little foramen or this little hole that basically appears between the three major bones of the hip. And both clades of dinosaurs have this hole and that hole goes all the way through the hip, okay? So that's your classic dinosaur hip. If you come down to the pterosaur hip down here, what you'll see here is it's not actually a hole. It's more like, for want of a better word, and this does not imply any relatedness whatsoever, but it's more like a socket hip, hip joint, uh, which we do see obviously in ourselves and, and, and most mammals, in fact, all mammals. Um, and so there, basically, you can see a major difference between your dinosaurs and your pterosaurs, okay? So that divides those. Now, so the flying part of dinosaurs. Okay, so think about an example here is your Velociraptor, or it could be a T-Rex, I'm not too sure. But this scenario that I'm depicting here is probably not going to work out too well, okay? And I like to get a little dad joke in here, and I think, well, you know, what do you call a dinosaur that's just jumped off a cliff? Terminal Velociraptor. That's my last dad joke, I apologize. Okay, so flying dinosaurs. So, okay, dinosaurs, early on, dinosaurs could not fly, essentially. Um, as they evolved, they could glide. So they're almost sort of have powered flight, but not quite. So this little fella, E. Chi, which is from China, the late Jurassic in China, this is a nice little reconstruction of E. Chi. And you can see here that it does have a kind of membrane bound wings, so to speak, okay? But they're subtly different. Now, this guy could not achieve powered flight like birds or pterosaurs or bats, which are still to this day the only vertebrates that essentially could achieve powered flight, pterosaurs being the first clade of animals to actually achieve this. So you will notice that it has an elongated third finger. That's important for later on. And it also has this little spar. It's technically not a, a metacarpal, so it's not part of the finger as such. It's just an extension of a sort of a wrist bone, uh, for want of a better description, uh, that, that grew, that basically supported this wing, uh, this membranous wing, uh, which allowed, we think, allowed E. Chi to be able to glide between trees. So this fossil was found in a, in a terrestrial environment. So um, we're thinking that perhaps it, it, it used its wings to basically glide, like uh, sugar gliders in Australia, we have sugar gliders, things like that. Not powered flight, but certainly capable of, of gliding flight. So that's dinosaurs attempting to fly. But of course, we all know now that dinosaurs could fly by the end of their evolution, but we don't call them dinosaurs anymore. We simply refer to them as birds. 
okay? So there are tens of thousands of species of flying dinosaurs hovering around the world to this day, quite capable, some of them anyway, uh, a lot of them capable of, of very good powered flight, okay? Some of them have secondarily lost that, like the ostrich or the emu. Uh, the kiwi is another example uh, where they've lost the ability to fly, but most still fly to this day. And they're a very important clade of animals. Um, even so, uh, you'll notice that there are now some official flying dinosaurs, okay? So we have the Australian coat of arms and your coat of arms, and you'll notice that they both contain official flying dinosaurs, okay? So that's myth number one, hopefully busted. So pterosaurs are not dinosaurs, and it wasn't until they eventually evolved into birds where dinosaurs could even were even capable of, of um, powered flight, okay? So let's move on to myth number two, where pterosaurs are simply just pterodactyls. And look, I still have colleagues that refer to everything that I study as pterodactyls. Now, I just want to point out that this is technically not correct, and I'll take you through why, okay? Let's hark back to uh, a few hundred years ago. We're talking the late 1700s. And this beautifully pre preserved fossil turns up from the Solnhofen uh, quarries in Germany and essentially lands in the lap of this uh, dapper Italian gentleman, Collini, back in 1784. And he was tasked with describing what the hell this animal was. Now, you've got to put this into context. You must realise that the term, you know, dinosaur or the term extinction, for that matter, didn't exist back in those days. So, you know, Collini would look at this and he was thinking, okay, it's got a massive sort of jaws. It's got these really elongated arms. Um, and he's wondering, you know, what is this thing? Okay. So he basically put forward a theory that, you know, it's, it has to be some kind of extinct marine creature. So this is the first time that scientists or, or naturalists, as they were called back then, came up with a concept that actually there may be animals that may have existed in the past that are no longer, okay? Now, this is from a naturalist point of view. Of course, some indigenous communities around the world had a concept of extinct, and they used that in some of their folklores and their myths, and they still do to this day. So when I say extinction was invented, sorry, the term extinction was invented here, it's not quite true. But in terms of in the scientific literature, this is when we get the concept of extinction existing. So Collini came, came forth with this proposal and said, hmm, those long arms, they look like they belong to flippers, okay? And basically that's how it existed for a while. Now you must remember too that the 1780s, we're still talking a good 40 years before dinosaurs, that term even came into existence, okay? So technically pterosaurs have been, or you know, the knowledge of pterosaurs have been around in the scientific community for at least 40 years longer than dinosaurs, just a little flag waving for us pterosaurologists. Anyway, so that was Collini's interpretation, some kind of bizarre marine creature with massive flippers. And then it went through different iterations over the time. So different people looked at this same fossil and came up with different interpretations. These two are obviously um, interpretations leaning towards a more mammalian point of view. Um, now, uh, you'll see Herman's interpretation here on the left. He's even gone so far as to add external genitalia, bless him, okay? Um, but you can see that this one on the left always reminds me of those hats the, the Mouseketeers used to wear on the Mickey Mouse Club, but perhaps that's just me. Um, and the one on the right, that interpretation from Newman, it's obviously very, very bat-like. Um, just the one on the, the bottom uh, is they have a slightly longer neck. But remember, these people had no concept that, you know, pterosaurs or um, reptiles, to, more specifically, were capable of flight. And it wasn't until this gentleman, so uh, George Cuvier, he was a French naturalist, sort of the, the, the godfather of, you know, taxonomy, so to speak. And he looked at this fossil back in 1801 
And he was the first one to realize and recognize its reptilian affinities. Uh, he looked at it closely and said, hang on, this has got certain features of the skull and also of the feet that a scream reptile. Um, and so he came up with the concept of this, as you see down the bottom there, it says reptile volant, so flying reptile. And he was the first one to posit uh, the fact that these, they, that these creatures were indeed reptilian in nature and that they could fly. And hence, uh, pterosaurs, as we know them, were born. But he named this fossil, and this is the first pterosaur to be named back in the early 1800s, and it was named Pterodactylus antiquitus, okay? And so this is a modern-day sort of reconstruction by Mark Whitten, who's a very, very good paleo artist. Um, and he basically, uh, this is what Pterodactyl antiquitus looked like, Pterodactylus, I mean, uh, antiquitus looked like. But the name, therefore, Pterodactylus kind of stuck because fossils kept appearing, especially from the UK, more from the, the states where you guys are, and these, these were just basically put into the basket of, oh, they're all pterodactylus. They're all kind of pterodactyls of some kind. Uh, they may be a different species, so they're not antiquitous, but they're all pterodactyls. And unfortunately, simple as this, this name just, uh, this name just stuck. And even up until the 1960s, people were still referring to any reptile that could fly as pterodactyls. When if we actually look at the family tree here, and I've tried to fit in as many of these sort of uh, species of pterosaurs that are known today, what you will see is that actually pterodactyls belong in this little clade highlighted here. So these technically are the only pterodactyls that we know. So to finish, uh, to finish my little myth busting sort of rant here, um, pterodactyls are pterosaurs but not all pterosaurs are pterodactyls, okay? So hopefully that's cleared it up and, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll all start to sort of start a new kind of, you know, the truth, which is that they just simply now refer to all of them as pterosaurs, okay? Which essentially just means winged lizard, okay? Good. So after me ranting about what's a pterosaur, what's not a pterosaur, what actually makes a pterosaur? So why are pterosaurs pterosaurs? Well, Let's look at this beautifully preserved sort of skeleton here. And there are a few features about any sort of reptilian skeleton that distinguishes them as being pterosaurs. So the first one is the really obvious feature where their fourth finger is heavily uh, hyper elongated. Uh, and obviously that forms the main spar of the, of the wing. So that's one feature we look out for. The second one is that the skull is always fairly, fairly long in relative, uh, sorry, in relative length to the, to the torso, to the rest of the body, okay? No other animal has this kind of ratio of skull length to torso length. So that's another feature. The third one, which is also important, is this little bone here that I've highlighted on both wings, and that's the wrist joint. And they have this little bone, which we've termed the pteroid, very imaginatively. Um, and this bone, we believe, was basically, uh, its function would have been something to do with the forward flap of the wing, so the prototagium, and it would have possibly adjusted the camber or the tautness, so to speak, which would have really come into play when these things were uh, landing, just like um, gliders can do. They can adjust the front wings to slow themselves up. Birds have an analogous kind of bone going on in their wings. Pterosaurs are the only ones that have this really, really long pteroid bone coming off their wrist joint. And the last one, the last feature I want to talk about is the actual, the, the, the thinness of the bone walls themselves. Now, I've got a little close-up here of a transversely sort of dissected pterosaur bone. And what you'll notice here is that the cortical bone, which is the outer layer of bone just here, uh, hopefully you can see my cursor going back and forth, so that is extremely thin, okay, that cortical bone. And when I say thin, I'm talking in the range of one millimetre to possibly two and a half millimetres in width. So incredibly, incredibly thin bone. So you're probably thinking, well, how did they fly? How are they able to land and things like that? Well, they internally, each of their bones were kind of had this network of supports. And these are little sort of 
ossified little struts called trabeculae. And these basically gave the internal bone the strength they needed to basically function as the flying and living animals they were, okay? So that is very important here. And so what does thin cortical bone give you? Well, one of the major sort of functions it gives you is the fact that you can still have relatively large bones in terms of length, okay? Um, because you've got to remember some of the largest pterosaurs we know, like Quetzalcoatlus, for instance, we think that probably had a wingspan in the order of about sort of uh, 11 meters or in, 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 in empirical, I believe that's around sort of 33-ish feet in a wingspan. So that's incredible. That's a, that's a light aircraft, essentially. So what this does, the com combination of these bony struts and also this thin uh, cortical bone enabled bones to become very long, very big, enabling huge wingspans in the um, in some of the younger pterosaurs that we know, whilst also providing large muscle attachment areas, which obviously is very important for these flying creatures, um, whilst keeping the weight completely light, okay? Now, you will also may recognize, if any of you have worked with birds before, birds have a very, very similar uh, osteology here. Uh, for obvious reasons, they're both flying creatures. And basically, you want to minimize weight whilst keeping a surface area maximized for, for muscle attachment. So, you know, wings can, uh, can work and, and legs can land and, and things like that. Okay. So, that's essentially what makes pterosaurs pterosaurs. Now, let's move on to the, to the highlight of this talk. And that's the rest of the talk, I'm going to be talking about the Australian pterosaurs. Now, um, unfortunately, I'm going to go through a really quick history of Australian pterosaurs. Why is it quick? Because we have so few, okay, compared to you guys or, or Europe or even South America, for that, for that matter. Uh, we have stuff all, excuse my French. Uh, we have um, pterosaurs have been found from all over our continent, but unfortunately, they're sort of fragmentary nature. It means that most of them are diagnostically useless, these specimens. We know they're pterosaurian in nature, given their, you know, the thinness of the cortical bone and some other features. But unfortunately, a lot of it just ends up being on a museum shelf, which is a simple tag that says pterosauria indeterminate. Okay. Um, so, yeah, I think we only beat uh, Antarctica, which isn't really saying that much. Uh, in terms of taxonomic richness, okay? We are catching up to say uh, the richness, species richness that's seen in Africa, but not quite, we're still a little bit off, but we're nowhere near the species richness that you find in the Americas or in Europe, okay? Uh, but anyway, that's just a little map showing you where some pterosaur fossils have found. So all up, we're looking at, we have roughly, and I think this number's just increased, but approximately 20 described specimens, okay? So that's a pterosaur bit from somewhere, okay? But to put this into context, okay, I'll go back briefly to uh, dinosaurs again. So we have 20 described specimens. Compare that to the well over thousands of specimens that we have of Australian dinosaurs, okay? Um, Unfortunately, as I was sort of hinting before, out of the 20 described specimens, only four of those specimens so far are diagnostically useful enough to erect a species on, okay? And I'll show you these, the, the four Australian species in, in a moment. But what you will recognize is that they're all based on uh, at least some part of the skull, whether that be the lower jaw, the mandible, or the upper jaw. Why is that? Well, quite simply, it's it's because that the skull is highly diagnostic, okay? A lot, if not most, of pterosaur species are diagnosed with, uh, at the very minimum, some part of the skull, okay? And that makes sense. A lot of animals are diagnosed that way because there is a lot of variation in the skull. Um, unfortunately, the elements that really preserve well in pterosaurs, so some of the more robust elements like the the shoulder attachment or some of the long bones in the wings, they, they preserve quite well because they are a sort of more robust uh, bone. Uh, and obviously, you know, they just hold up the test of time. 
Um, but unfortunately, they're not really diagnostic. They're useful for maybe getting down to a family, if that, but certainly not useful for getting down to a kind of a, a special level of, of identification, okay? Um, anyway, so we have four Australian pterosaur species. Now compare that to 150 at least uh, species known worldwide. So Australia essentially accounts for around about less than 3% of all uh, pterosaur uh, species, okay? So why, so why so few pterosaurs? Well, the answers are really quite simple. A, they are an exceptionally rare animal, okay? Um, just given, given how many, and this is worldwide. So they obviously weren't as, you know, as a clade, as pterosaurs as a whole group, obviously weren't, weren't quite as, uh, you know, diverse, in terms of biota mass, as say your pterosaurs or uh, sorry, dinosaurs or your mammals, things like that. So they're much rarer. As I mentioned before, a lot of the bones that we, pterosaur bones that we find are extremely fragmentary. Um, they're mostly isolated. So we rarely find, you know, e even part of a skeleton laid out. Um, and because of that, you know, their diagnostic utility is always questionable. Um, we, as I said before, we can't get down to those sort of really minute details if you're just looking at a, a, a phalange or a, some type of, you know, femur or something like that. It's really hard to, to get those bones down to a species level. And also, of course, and this is not just with pterosaurs, but there are incredible biases in the fossil record. So that may be a preservational bias, i.e. where does this animal die and does that mean that we're likely to find it 100 million years later, or is it likely just to basically disappear and never be found again? There's also sampling biases that account for some of this, uh, the rarity of pterosaurs in Australia. So where we look, for instance, um, to this date, I'm aware, I think there's only maybe about three, possibly four of us in Australia that we could probably call ourselves pterosaur researchers. Most people in Australia, uh, if they're working in, you know, in the uh, Mesozoic, they're dinosaur researchers. There's, uh, you have your group of mammal researchers that are looking for that elusive, you know, Mesozoic mammal. Uh, but there's only a hell of a, a, a few of us that are looking for uh, pterosaurs. So there's a sampling bias that also goes on. Perhaps they're out there. We just haven't found them yet. Okay, so let me introduce you to the Australian pterosaurs that we do know. So this is my Thunga Kamara, okay? It was Australia's first named dinosaur. This is back in 2007. Now, the actual fossil itself was found decades uh, before this, I believe, back in the 80s. Uh, but it wasn't formally described until 2007. And what you're seeing here is a nice section of mandible, lower jaw down the bottom, and the sort of the midsection of the uh, maxilla or the sort of the upper jaw here with the anterior end of the naso and orbital fenestra, which is this big sort of hole that pterosaurs and in fact, most archosaurs had in their uh, upper jaw. Um, so this is what we have. You'll see some nice, you know, really gnarly teeth going on, a few teeth sockets where the teeth have obviously been lost. But this was as good as it got for a while. For a good 10 years, this, this was, um, well, that's not quite true, maybe five years. This was as, the only Australian uh, pterosaur. And it, it does, it sort of, you know, it makes sense that when this was published, it was a nature paper, which is, as you can understand, the be all and end all for any scientist. As you get your, you know, research published by nature, it's like, oh, the holy grail. Anyway, so this was a nature paper, and that was described by uh, Ralph Molnar and Tony, Tony Tholburn back in 2007. Okay, so fast forward, the second Australian pterosaur we have is called Aussie Draco Molnari. Now, um, I've put there the odd one out, and I'll point out why in a second. So you can see the scale bar there. This is a, quite a tiny specimen, and what you're looking at here is basically the front tip or the anterior tip of the lower jaw, okay? And it has some nice alveoli here, teeth sockets. It also has this sort of uh, a ridge going down, which a lot of pterosaurs have. They have this kind of mandibular ridge uh, or um, groove, I should say, that goes down here. And unfortunately, this, this end, the more posterior end, has long since uh, disappeared. 
but it's the odd one out. Why? Uh, oh, sorry, I normally add a little thing here. I have a little bit of cultural cringe with this name, Aussie Draco, and I also have a bit of cringe every time we watch an Australian at the Olympics and they're like, Aussie, 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 oi, oi, oi. So I, I tend to add that, but let's just fast forward. <laughs> um, okay, so the odd one out. You will notice here, this is the bottom edge of the mandible, okay, down here. You're looking at it from a lateral view now. This is sideways. What you'll notice is that this, the top edge or the sort of the ventral surface of this mandible is um, convex, okay? It bulges outwards. And this is very, very unusual for pterosaurs, okay? Um, and it's basically the only uh, Australian pterosaur that doesn't, and I'll show you uh, a phylogeny later on, a family tree, but I will point out that this is the only one that doesn't fall into a nice sort of family where all other Australian pterosaurs fall out into, okay? So hence the, the odd one out. Uh, all the rest of the Australian pterosaurs are what we call anaguerids, which is a big sort of family of pterosaurs. And we find anaguerids worldwide. They were totally cosmopolitan in their distribution. This one though is not anaguerid and they named it and stuck it in a clade called Targaryen Draconia. And for those of you that are Game of Thrones fans, you will know where that name came from, from the family Targaryen, okay? Some people have weird ways of naming things. But anyway, uh, just like to point out that uh, this is not a pterosaur she brought in. It's a mythical uh, dragon. Anyway, so that's Aussie Draco. Right, the third Australian pterosaur, and this one's a beauty, okay? So it's the most complete uh, pterosaur we have in Australia. This is just the, the skull elements. So you'll see here a nice large uh, premaxillary crest here. You've got the lower jaw down here. It's broken off. We're assuming there's a start of a crest down here. Uh, but what you'll notice is that, you know, this is quite exquisite, but unfortunately, the further back down the skull, it's, it's, it's missing, okay? So, but otherwise, a very, very nice sort of example of Australia's most complete, um, just to put things into context. So the rest of the elements they have, they do have some wing elements. They have a partial, a partial uh, shoulder element and some cervical vertebrae just here and other little bits and pieces of the skull as well. So that's Ferro Draco. Essentially, that just means iron dragon. And that's because the, uh, the rocks that this was found in is called iron stone. Um, but that's Ferro Draco. And that was only recently published a couple of years ago uh, by uh, another research worker in, in Melbourne. So that's a beautiful specimen. Right, so then we come to my research, and this is Australia's newest and uh, ultimately the largest in terms of wingspan. Now, remember, I'll talk about that in a second. But what you'll notice here is we don't have that much, okay? But thankfully, what we do have is highly diagnostic, okay? So what you're looking at here is the lower jaw or the mandible. So you have right the front tip here, you have this massive mandibular crest that's a roughly around about 13 centimetres from ventral to dorsal. Uh, you also have uh, at least 13 alveoli going down the side. Now, this little piece here is not a tooth. Um, I got excited when I first saw this specimen thinking we had a tooth attached. Unfortunately, it's just a shell fragment. Uh, the, the horizon, the bedding that this fossil was found in, uh, has uh, incredible amounts of fish and uh, marine life in it. And so that is just a little part of a, of a little shell from uh, a bivalve. But anyway, we have this very, very nice, sort of very uh, well-preserved, except for the bits that are missing, uh, mandible, the anterior portion of a mandible. And so we were able to basically describe this and ultimately it was published in the Journal of Vertebrate Paleontology. And that was, uh, I think, around about August or September last year. And we erected the, uh, the fourth uh, named Australian pterosaur. So let me take you on a little story on how all this came to be. Now, this is the original figure I just showed you. So the first thing, as I explained at the top of the talk, um, I came to this PhD with just the knowledge that there were some pterosaur fossils hidden in a drawer up at a museum in central Queensland that needed to be described and looked at, and it would make a great little PhD project. So 
basically uh, I went back and I had to learn the history about all these fossils that were found. So the first question you need to ask yourself is where was it found? Now, as I described before, this is obviously a, a partial map of, of Australia. And you'll notice that Richmond, the town Richmond has been highlighted there. And that's where this fossil comes from, okay? Basically about, uh, roughly about 15 to 12 kilometers, uh, excuse me, I'm not too sure what that is in miles, but not quite as many uh, you know, miles. Uh, northwest of Richmond, there's a little fossil area, which the public can go to and have a scratch around. But it's, um, this is where this fossil was found. And it was found in uh, 2011. Uh, and I'll talk about it. So here is the site. Uh, I went up there, took some photos. Now, on this day, as I said before, uh, the public is welcome to come in. They just pay, I think it's like a, a $5 fossicking license. And you're able to go into this uh, what's called free fossil, free fossil hunting site and have a little bit of a scratch around. In, uh, in the bedding here. And all the bedding, you can see at these people's feet, that's part of the Tulabuck formation. And we're, we're talking late Cretaceous, around about 104 million years old, roughly, uh, predominantly made up of limestone, which for those of you that know your geology would suggest that this was once an ancient marine depos depositional setting. And these people are having a look around, but yeah, my, the, the fossil that we worked on came from this site. I don't know what the guy at the back's doing. Maybe he's given up fossicking and thrown a hand line into the pond looking for some catfish. Not sure. But anyway, part of uh, this museum in Richmond, which is called Chronosaurus Corner, uh, they have twice a year, they have an event called the Big Dig. And it's a great exercise in citizen science. So you get all these volunteers turn up and they obviously go in and they conduct digs at this site, okay? And here's one. Uh, this was not the event that where, where the, the pterosaur was found, but another event more recently. Um, and you can see there's a lot of people hovering around, a lot of activity, um, because the slab, as you can see, the size of the slab they're trying to extract, it's quite large. And it's, it's basically a job for, for many hands on deck, okay? But it's a great example of, of citizen science, which is in, encouraged, um, you know, as long as record, good record keeping is taking it and that it really, really helps because there's such, as you can imagine, uh, you know, central outback Queensland is, is a massive area. You can drive for two days, literally, and still be in Queensland. It's, it, it's a, an enormous state, okay? But anyway, so this is an example of the big dig. Now, I just want to point out something that You'll see here that uh, except for the guy that's got the, the crowbar, most people are using little, little tools to sort of chip away very, very carefully at the, uh, at the bedding. And this is your typical sort of paleontologist toolkit, okay? You've got these really, really sort of fine uh, tools here, like little chisels. You've got tweezers, some little dentistry picks, uh, a ge geologist hammer, a little sledgehammer. So very, very, you know, very typical paleontologist tools, okay? Now, I wanna tell you about how our pterosaur was discovered. It was discovered by a gentleman called Len Shaw. And Len Shaw is a Richmond local, has been living in the area for his entire life. And he's been scratching around a very, very good sort of amateur fossil hunter. Uh, and he's been scratching around these, these pits and around the rocks of Richmond for close to 50 years. And um, his method of sort of finding fossils was quite unique. And I want to take you through that. So he would use, you know, his paleo toolkit consisted of this. So what Len would do, Len worked for the council and he would drive these front end loaders. And during his lunch breaks, he would like to basically uh, jump in his front end loader He'd go down to that pond, the big water pond that I showed in a previous slide. He'd fill up the bucket with a bit of water. You know, you know, we're talking hundreds of litres of water. Then he would go to some particular sort of area in this, in this site and he would slowly tip the bucket so the water would come out. And it was a very effective, if not crude, but very effective way of washing the top soil or the top layer of dirt off a certain area. And lo and behold, in 2011, one day he was doing this um, and he came across this. And this is what he saw. Now, I don't know if you can see it. Hopefully you can. But 
there is our fossil right there. So you can see here the alveoli, the tooth sockets, that is that the start of the mandibular crest that I was talking about. So this is the front end and that's the back end. Now, the only unfortunate thing about when I saw this photo, because obviously I wasn't, I wasn't at this, this dig, um, I come in later on in the picture. But the unfortunate thing about this photo is this element here, which was never recovered, which looks to me like some, some you know, a fragmented sort of long bone, possibly wing, maybe leg, unsure, but that was never recovered, unfortunately. Uh, why? Because of the method that they used to extract this fossil from the rock was rather crude as well. So they basically got a rock saw in and uh, basically proceeded to cut out a huge slab that contained the mandible. Unfortunately, though, they sort of, you know, we lost a bit of some of the other elements in the process. But never mind, we still got a very, very well sort of preserved and detailed mandible out of it. So after they extracted that slab from the rock, it then went to the then curator of, of Kronosaurus Corner, a, a gentleman uh, by the name of Paul Stumcat. And he had the painstaking, uh, he went through the painstaking process of trying to prepare this fossil. And I'm sure some of you have maybe had a go at preparing fossils from Matrix. It is painstaking and there is a, a high degree of skill and artistry that is involved in this. So I've kind of shown a little sort of uh, dive flow chart here of it going through different iterations. And as you can see, it gradually went from a hunk of rock all the way to the, the mandible here. And hats off to Paul, who also is one of the co-authors and part of the research team. Uh, that he did a marvelous job at getting that mandible out of that rock. Okay, so where to from here? We, we now have the fossil. This is where I came in uh, and I started the PhD back in uh, 2018. So this is some seven years or so after the fossil was discovered. It was basically sitting in a nice little display cabinet in, and I've been talking about it. This is the museum in Richmond called Kronosaurus Corner. Now its namesake is this huge uh, pliosaurid, which has been found in the area as well. And it was named Kronosaurus Queensland Dacticus. Um, and obviously it has a nice little sort of statue uh, devoted to it out the front of the museum. But this is where all those pterosaur fossils were basically hiding for all those years in a pretty little display case uh, right there. Uh, you'll notice there's a gap in this display case here. That's where actually my mandible used to, used to sit or our mandible, I should say. Uh, and so I'd already taken it out by that point before I took the photo. So what did we do then? So basically my job was to essentially document everything, measure anything that could be measured, photograph anything that could be measured. Here's an example of me with my light box. This gives you an indication of just how thin this mandible is, by the way. Uh, you can see my hands for reference and how incredibly thin. You're looking at the, the ventral part or the, the palate region. That's the part you can see there. Um, and all in all, just of this one specimen, I took around about, I looked through my files, about 400 odd photos of this specimen. Because one thing about uh, paleontology and field work in general, especially with Australia being so big uh, and also with COVID hitting, I'm glad I did this. I had to document as much as I could there and then because it's quite expensive traveling around Australia, just going back. If you've missed something, going back to have a quick look at that fossil again, you can't really do that. So you need to document. Uh, so yeah, 403 photos. And basically I documented not only this fossil, but all the other pterosaur fossils that were there. And then came back to the University of Queensland and started to compare it to any pterosaur that I could find, you know, which had a, a mandible that kind of looked like this. Now, after around about a year of research of teaching myself pterosaurs and going through the literature, I realized that some features of our fossil had some very unique features or what we call apomorphies, okay? So one of them was that, remember the groove from Aussie Draco that's on the ventral surface? This pterosaur doesn't have one of those grooves. It's very, very unusual for a pterosaur not to have a mandibular groove. The other thing that I noticed that no other pterosaur had in the world was that the alveoli are all positioned laterally on the side, obviously, of the jaw. Very unusual again. 
The teeth are very diagnostic in pterosaurs and the spacing of the teeth here and also the size of the teeth is very, very diagnostic. So they were the unique features about this pterosaur. And then it also had a combination of features which have been seen in, in other pterosaurs, but not all together at once. And some of that was the fact that, you know, the, the, um, the dorsal surface uh, of the of the terror of the man mandible is slightly deflected okay going upwards here you have this the, the anterior margin of the crest is a concave kind of shape and you also have these massive bony collars so these are these robust sort of alveoli collars made of bone and there was a few features like that but put them all together they'd never been seen in a pterosaur before um, and as i pointed out too you can see from this sort of anterior photo here or this front on shot it's incredibly thin. By the time we get down here, it's around about two to three mil. So it's essentially just cortical bone. That's all there is there. So it's incredibly thin crest, okay? Um, and then also I sort of compared the size um, and the length of, of the alveoli. Now for years, while this specimen was sitting in this cupboard uh, up in Richmond, a few researchers, paleos had been through the place and they just never really studied it in detail. But a lot of them had their, you know, as most paleontologists do, had their two cents about it. And they just wrote it off and said, oh, it's an Anaguera species. It's, it's one of the Anaguera's which come from South America. And look, superficially, yeah, it does look like Anaguera, okay? But when you compare the dentition of Anaguera, so that's those two here. So we're talking this purple and the blue line. Anaguera are diagnosed, or one of the features that diagnosed as Anaguera, okay, is that the fifth and the sixth, sixth two teeth in width are smaller than the fourth and the seventh. And every Anaguera species has this, okay? You compare uh, Tabonaga, our specimen, and it quite clearly does not follow that trend, okay? So then I compared it to another one, which it sort of superficially looked like, and that was Tropi Ignatus, again, from South America. And again, you'll see that it wasn't, the dentition pattern didn't quite match. So I knew, okay, it's not gonna be Anaguera and it can't be Tropi Ignatus. This has to be sort of something new. And that just highlights the bits I was, I was looking at, okay? And there's Tropi Ignatus. So we knew we had something new, okay? And we thought, let's write a paper and erect Australia's fourth, a fourth uh, pterosaur. And we, we called it Tabonaga Shorei. So what's in a name? Okay, so look, I thought it appropriate and respectful. This fossil comes from uh, what we call Wanamara country, where the Wanamara people uh, obviously reside. And I did some digging through sort of lexicons and, and ancient dictionaries, indigenous dictionaries. And I really wanted a, a generic uh, name or a genus name that reflected the history of where this fossil came from. So I, I happened upon two words um, from the Wanamara people. And the first one was taboon, which is not spelt the way it sounds, obviously. And that meant spear. The second word was naga, which meant mouth. And I thought, given how thin this, the, the mouth of this beast actually was, that would be a really appropriate name, Tabunaga, okay? And it simply means, obviously, spear now. Now, this, the uh, specific name or the species name uh, is simply, an, uh, you know, honouring Len, Len Shaw in the front end loader. So we ended up with uh, Tabunaga Shorei, okay? And that's how the name sort of came about. It simply means Shaw's spear mouth, okay? So when we put this into a phylogeny tree, you'll notice that it comes out here. And these are the three Australian pterosaurs that I previously mentioned. They all come out in a very, very close cluster. Now they do differ from each other in terms of dentition, in terms of size, in terms of placement of the teeth. So they are not the same species, but they are obviously very, very closely related based on morphological features, okay? And then the Aussie Draco one, that odd one out, it comes out up here, okay? Just to put it into context. So it's, it's, it's unlike any of the other three Australian pterosaurs. So what does this mean? If they're closely related, it could possibly hint at the fact that perhaps what we're looking at is an endemic radiation of Australian pterosaurs. So somewhere back in time, 
we had a hypothetical ancestor of these creatures, you know, arrive in Australia or sort of Eastern Gondwana as it would have been back then. And perhaps they have now radiated out based on little, uh, you know, differences in, in ecological niches or, or, you know, food partitioning, things like that. And they become their own species after time, their own species. So perhaps this is what it's pointing to, okay? Now, obviously, based on such fragmentary material and the fact that we've only got, you know, really one, one specimen of each species, we can't say that this hypothesis holds up for sure. It, it certainly is a signal, but we don't know for sure just yet. And obviously, more work, more discoveries are needed before we really know that we have a sort of an endemic clade in, of, of pterosaurs in Australia. The next thing people want to know when you sort of erect a new species and you've got a new pterosaur, they want to know how big was it, okay? So what I want to show you here, this is a little bit of a complex slide, but I'll take you through it. So how do we estimate, you know, the wingspan of an animal when all we have is the, basically the anterior portion of the lower jaw? Well, it's very difficult. And any estimation that we come up with is obviously speculative, okay? We don't know for sure. But what we can do is we have a near complete element, and that is this, this element here, which is called the man, mandibular symphysis, okay? And it's essentially where the two dentary bones, the two bones of your lower jaw are fused together, and that's called the symphysis, okay? Now, we can compare that, that the length of that element with uh, pterosaurs that also have mandibular symphysis, uh, symphysial lengths, and they also have known, you know, wingspans because they're complete skeletons. And so what I did essentially was compare it to some closely related uh, pterosaurs that do have both of these elements. And we came up with a wingspan of anywhere between sort of six to seven metres in wingspan, okay? So we're talking about roughly 21 to 22 feet, okay, in wingspan, which is for Australia, that was the largest pterosaur we'd ever seen. And in fact, in terms of the, the bigger picture here with the with a family that this pterosaur belongs to, Anangueridae, it's actually probably the third biggest Anangueridae that we found worldwide, okay? So that's what this refers to, this little diagram. That's how we come up with a wingspan. But again, I do need to reiterate, this is obviously speculative, okay? We don't really know for sure, but it's gonna be in that sort of ballpark, assuming, that the ratio between symphysis and wingspans in these closely related pterosaurs were the same or very, very close to each other, okay? So there's a few assumptions that are being made there. Um, just to put that into sort of context, so if we have a pterosaur tabonaga, that is seven metres, so compare that to our wedge-tailed eagle. Now, I did a little research. Your bald eagle, I believe, has an average wingspan of, of roughly the same, maybe slightly smaller than 2.5, but that's just to put it into context. And a hang glider, a typical hang glider is around about 10 metres in wingspan or 30 odd feet. Okay, so that's just a nice little pictorial showing you how big uh, this animal was. Okay, so what else do we know? Well, we do know that this was found, as I said before, in a marine setting, okay? So we know that Tabonaga was associated with a kind of a marine setting uh, 104 million years ago. And you'll see the map of Australia here. It looks completely different. And the middle sort of two thirds of Australia was covered uh, by a vast sort of inland shallow sea called the Eramanga Sea. So our beast was obviously flying over this sea, uh, utilizing the, the resources that the marine setting had to offer. And there are also some, you know, hypotheses, not from, not from our research, but from other research with uh, pterosaurs from marine sort of related settings, that perhaps they used little islands within the sea as kind of nesting sites or, or things like that. Now, the irony, of course, with this is this was called the Eramanga Sea because it's named after a town uh, in, in central Queensland called Eramanga. Uh, which is now famous for being the furthest town from any sea in Australia. So the, the irony, I love it. Uh, anyway, so that's sort of, that's where this guy lived and roamed. And it obviously used, uh, you know, there was a lot of food and I'll talk about this in a second. Okay, so then we start to think, okay, so we know the sort of environment, the paleo environment where this guy was living. What did it eat? Okay, now, 
based on the size of those teeth and the orientation of them, they look very, very gnarly, okay? And when I was speaking to a journalist uh, when this paper was published, he was asking me, uh, saying, you know, what did it eat? What did it eat? And I was saying, well, of course, we don't know for sure because we didn't find any stomach contents, you know, um, but we're assuming it probably had a sort of a piscivorous diet and it was feeding on, on fish or some of your local invertebrates. And he kept pushing the issue saying, can you, you know, name something at eight? And I sort of, being a little smart, I said, well, it certainly uh, didn't eat broccoli. Um, and you really got to be careful what you tell some journalists because the next thing you know, the headline from The Guardian was, it wasn't built to eat broccoli. And they, they actually quoted me and I was like, oh, wow, okay. So look, I can pretty much guarantee this thing wasn't vegan, okay? So what did it eat? Well, for that, we need to go back to a paleo diet. Another dad joke. And look in the paleo pyramid. And look, my guess is it probably feasted on meat of some kind and fish, perhaps a little bit of eggs as well. So it's getting some nutrition there. But it certainly wasn't getting all five food groups to my knowledge. And that's, that's my hypothesis anyway. So if we have a look at what was hanging around the Aramanga Sea at the time, we see there is a whole menu of sort of invertebrates, fish, turtles, your te marine tetrapods, even possibly little juvenile dinosaurs. And it had a vast selection of basically goods that it could have eaten, okay? Now, I just want to point out that some of these fish, especially the, um, the Richmond Ichthys and the, the Kuyu, they are sort of large predatory fish that are in the order of about one metre to two metres in length. We're talking huge fish. Um, so perhaps it didn't eat mature Caillou or rich Manichthys. Perhaps it just sort of feasted on the little sort of baby fingerlings, which may have still been, you know, half a metre long. But anyway, that is my sort of guess about what it would have eaten, okay, and, and what its diet would have been. So that's about it so far. The research continues for my PhD, and I do actually have a paper that's uh, uh, under review at the moment. Uh, just to give you a little heads up, it involves uh, another element, obviously a pterosaur, but we think this is another element or part of the uh, upper jaw now, the, the maxilla of Tabonaga as well. So Look, it's quite exciting, but we're, we're starting to learn more and more and more about this animal. And look, the, um, the last thing I want to say is you've all seen this before. This was the media release that came. I have since sort of uh, engaged with a paleo artist. This is simply just an Adobe stock image that we kind of modified in a real rush to get it, to get it out with the media. And it's amazing because ever since this was released, I have got emails from all around the world telling me what's wrong with this picture and look that's fine but again we only had the lower jaw so you know we really don't know some people said its feet are too small its feet are in the wrong orientation possibly but we really don't know because all we had at the time was the lower jaw and essentially really the media loves a good picture uh, look, that is where I'll leave it. Uh, the last thing I just want to say is uh, again I just want to thank uh, Lance and Bronwyn for again inviting me and uh, uh, for tonight's talk, as you know, with any sort of research, there is a ton of people uh, you need to thank, my co-authors, all my colleagues, the curators and all the staff at Kronosaurus Corner and, and Queensland Museum, a couple of other research workers, obviously my family, a bit of funding thrown in, which is always good. And uh, look, I really hope you have enjoyed the talk. Thank you. Jim, thank you so much. We can all come back together. I I, I'm, I feel so much smarter now. Thank you. <laughs> Pleasure. I'm just stopping the screen. Lovely. Let me uh, put a spotlight on you real quick. Um, and hold on one second. We will do. No, I, I just want to say I didn't have my chat box open during that entire talk. So. I wasn't ignoring uh, questions. I just didn't see them. I just didn't want to have that sort of distracting me as I was giving the talk. So I'm only now reading all the comments in the chat box. Uh, yeah, and so um, <clears throat> what really, uh, oh, sorry.
my mother keeps calling me. <laughs> oh, I can, uh, while you sort that out, I can start asking some questions. Uh, yeah. Thanks, mate. Yeah, all right. So, uh, first off, excellent talk. I really enjoyed that uh, and learned a lot about Australian pterosaurs, which I knew very little to nothing about. Uh, so, Thank it was really cool. Um, so, the first question comes from Sarah Cook, and she yep. asks, uh, are there uh, as darked uh, pterosaurs found in Australia? And I hope I pronounced uh -huh. that correctly. Now, this, in, in terms of pterosaur research, this is the holy grail. Finding an as darkened in Australia would be the pinnacle. Uh, look, all we have uh, at the moment is a very, um, uh, basically, uh, half of an ulna from Western Australia. Um, and this is Maastrichtian in age. So we're talking, you know, 66 to 67 million years old. There's a, a part of an ulna which we think belongs to an Asdarkid, but we're obviously, which Asdarkid, we can't diagnose it any further than that, but it looks very, very much like uh, most of your Asdarkid owners. But that's the only element in Australia that is possibly Asdarkid. Yeah, so not yet is the answer. We don't have them just yet. For and then... Uh, as dark as that refers, if I if I'm remembering correctly, that's like Quetzalcoatlus and those really big yes. ones, right? Yeah. yeah, they're the massive ones that were around in the in the very sort of in the late uh, Cretaceous, and they got huge. Uh, predominantly, you know, I think we've we found them from everywhere, every other continent now, except for Australia and Antarctica, I believe. Um, so look, it wouldn't surprise me. If we did find as darkets, uh, but we just haven't found them yet. Uh, next question comes from Kathleen Morosco, and she asks uh, about the taphonomy. Would the jaw have been any wider in life? Was it crushed at all? Uh, what was yeah, the preservation? that's a great question. Um, we looked at that. We looked at that closely, um, and the fact that uh, one thing I didn't go on about, but it, it, those really robust bony collars that surround each of the alveoli, um, they were not crushed at all. Um, there is a little bit of sort of eggshell cracking in the cortical bone on the crest, on the lateral surfaces of the crest. Um, so perhaps there may have been a little bit of compaction, but given the preservation of the rest of the element, which doesn't really show much much sign of compaction at all or distortion, plastic distortion or whatnot. Uh, I don't think there's that much compaction going on. The next question comes from uh, Adrian Malik, who is indeed our uh, one of our fossil curators. And he says, yes. how do you know this is an, a lower jaw and, and not an upper jaw? Mm, again, great question. This is, I'm going to admit a little faux pas that I made. So when I just started my research, I was, um, I, I traveled to LA and I'd literally been in the PhD for about four months and, and was still learning everything. And I presented a talk at a pterosaur symposium in LA and the room is filled with, you know, 60 pterosaur experts, everyone that you're citing, essentially, anyone that's, you know, anyone was in the room. And I gave the talk uh, on, on this particular specimen, but I had it upside down. I had it, I originally thought that this was the upper jaw. Uh, and then it was pointed out to me a few features, uh, unfortunately, mid talk, <laughs> where I was, you know, uh, they were very polite about it. They realized I was very sort of young, uh, uh, sorry, well, very new to a PhD and pterosaurs in general. but. Uh, one of the big giveaways is the fact that that dorsal deflection where the end of the uh, mandible goes up. So in um, Aninguerid, so the big family that does contain Tabonaga, um, there isn't one case where the upper jaw, is if you flipped it, that deflection would now go down. There isn't one case where that actually happens in, in Aninguerid's. Um, and it only happens in as darkets. And as you know, um, you know as darkets uh, don't have teeth. So we know this isn't an as darkened. Um, and there was a, a, a few other bits uh, as well. So uh, towards the back end, uh, there's this little sort of 
uh, Michelian fossa, which is a little sort of a hole in the lower jaw of most reptiles. So we can see that as well, well the, the end of it, it's, it's broken, but we think we're interpreting that as that. Um, so we're pretty sure that uh, it's, it's a lower jaw. And also uh, the other thing, of course, is that the, the okay, so the width, the front teeth of, of pterosaurs, so you basically had your two front teeth, top teeth coming down like that, your two bottom teeth interlock like that. And it doesn't go the other way around like that in all, in all um, Anangueras. So the space between the two front teeth and the two back teeth, now we don't have the top jaw, I know that, but the space is between the two bottom teeth is very, very consistent with the spacing that's seen in, in most lower jaws of, of Anangueras. Yep. Uh, you're muted, Mason. Sorry. Uh, yeah. Tom Prunier asks uh, about the background that you have uh, showing. Uh, that's, yeah, that's actually uh, fossil pit number one. So that's uh, the tailings piles from, you know, years of fossicking around. I thought I'd just if I get out of it. There you are. That is, uh, that's the area just sort of oh, maybe 30, 40 metres from where the fossil was found. That's really cool. Uh, Barbara M asks, uh, will the fossil go back to the Richmond Museum or is it going to oh, be yeah. displayed at the university? No, 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 no. So, um, yeah, with, as you can probably imagine um, and appreciate yourself, um, these smaller regional museums are very, for rightly so, very possessive of what they find um, because it's not just about the science to them. Uh, it's also about tourism for these little towns. And so a lot of these fossils, and look, there was never any question, the fossil is staying in Richmond. The only difference uh, that's going to happen is that now, because it's a holotype specimen, it's going to have a nicer display case to be in. And also the label will change. Instead of saying Pterosauria in debt, it'll now say Tabonaga Shorai. Uh, but it's the pride and joy uh, you know, because this Chronosaurus corner in Richmond has a lot of holotype specimens. It's a very important uh, museum, even though it's only small. Um, and so, no, there was never a question. It'll stay. It'll stay in Richmond. Uh, I don't know who asked it because they don't have a username, but they asked, what is the benefits or possible reason or reasons uh, for laterally oriented teeth? Mm. Yeah, that's something I've been thinking of, and I kind of, I do touch on it in my next paper. Um, well, obviously, it's going to mean, it depends, again, we don't have any teeth preserved in situ, which is a, a shame, but it would mean that the, uh, the orientation of the teeth are going to be slightly, you know, more sort of uh, laterally with the mandible, laterally dorsally orientated. So instead of just going straight up teeth, you know, if the jaw is going this way, they'd be a bit more like that, um, which would give it a bit more of a sort of a basket in terms of its teeth to, to hold on to things when it's trying to use its teeth. And now, look, if, if we're correct and, you know, we assume that this thing was feeding on marine life, so they would have been slippery, wriggling animals that are trying to get out of the mouth. Um, it may have, you know, it would have influenced its diet some way. I don't really want to say too much, but yeah, it just gave it a bit more of a sort of a basket to hold on to things, I believe. We have another question from Sarah Cook. She asks, uh, so the Asdarkids replaced the early, earlier Ornithochiroids uh, and Anguirids yep. in the late Cretaceous in Australia, possibly. Are there any Jurassic Ramphorinkids in uh, Australia? No. Or no, unfortunately not. There is the, um, the no, the, uh, no, <laughs> it's the quick answer to that. We don't have any Jurassic material whatsoever of Australian pterosaurs. Uh, the, um, the, the, the oldest stuff would be the Albion, which is the you know, Tabonaga, Mythunga, is, and also uh, Targaryen, uh, sorry, Aussie Draco. Uh, they're all sort of Albion in age, maybe a, a little bit younger. And then, as I mentioned before, you do have that, that element from the Maastrichtian but certainly nothing older than that, no. 
Uh, Adrian asks, uh, have you done an X-ray or a CAT scan of the specimen or anything like yeah. that? I, I tried putting it through a CT scan when I first got it. Um, unfortunately, the matrix and the bone material, the densities are very similar. And as you know, how CAT, CAT scans work, um, unfortunately, when you put it through and we looked at the images, it looked like a big, bright Christmas tree. And it was, it was incredibly hard to uh, basically discern what was bone, where did bone start and where did matrix start. Um, and to, I'm talking internally now. Um, obviously, you could see the extremities quite clearly, but when you looked inside the bone, it, it was just, in, no incredibly hard but that's not to say that they're all like that i'm also working on a scapular coracoid which is the shoulder sort of girdle of pterosaurs and that's a really really well preserved scapular coracoid and i also through that through a ct scan uh, that a lot of it has come up really pretty under ct scan and, and you can see a lot of these internal features like the trabeculae those little struts that i was talking about um, but that's come up really really nicely whereas this bone and another piece that I'm working on, I, they all went through CAT scan and unfortunately it's just, it's not useful at all. Uh, Lance asks, uh, uh, just to confirm, pterosaurs were an evolutionary dead end uh, and, and birds are completely separate evolving from dinosaurs. Correct, yeah. Uh, we don't have any living relatives of pterosaurs and uh, the birds, uh, obviously came from theropods, so you, 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 you know, T-Rexes and your Velociraptors, that sort of dinosaur, they eventually, somewhere along that tree, birds, are they broke off, but no, pterosaurs, unfortunately, do not have any contemporary relatives. Uh, next one comes from Bronwyn, and I'm going to add something of my own onto it. Uh, she, asked, she says, so you didn't start out with a passion for pterosaurs. Uh, you were working with Cambrian creatures, of course, but uh, what's your feeling on them now? And what I'm going to say is, uh, what do you, what, what's next for Tim Richards? Are you going to stick with pterosaurs or do you have another? Uh, you know what? I, I, I still, despite the frustration they've provided me over four years now, um, I, I still, you know, love them. Uh, will I be working on them in 10 years? The, the answer to that is, you know, in all honesty, is maybe not. There's just not enough material to, in Australia, to devote a whole career to, to pterosaurs. Um, they may be always part of my research somewhere. Um, but uh, no, I, 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 unless we find, I come across some kind of massive sort of, mass death assemblage of pterosaurs that sets me up for the next 30 years. Uh, I, I can't see myself working exclusively with Australian pterosaurs, really. That's the reality of it. So, uh, but I still, I still love them. Um, a little bit of background, actually, my undergrad is actually in genetics. So I'm, I'm also a casual academic and teach genetics as well. So uh, ideally, I'd like to sort of combine those two disciplines and uh, and I'm not talking Jurassic parks and things like that, but, um, you know, uh, try and work out uh, some ancient enzymes and uh, ancient kind of biomarkers and uh, who knows. But, yeah, that's kind of what I'm interested in as well. Unfortunately, or fortunately or unfortunately, it's there's not a, a really big centre for that in Australia. Um, so that would involve, you know, going OS somewhere. Well, it sounds like some exciting things in store for you <laughs> yeah. in the future. Uh, so I look forward to seeing that. Um, and George Spica, our other fossil curator, asks, are there Cambrian, uh, uh, are there Cambrian stromatolites and, and other things related to that in Australia? Uh, in, with, in where I'm looking? Yeah, or in just Australia in general, oh, I think. In, is yes, um, stromatolites, uh, look. It's a great question, George, and you've got me. I'm going to say my honest answer is I'm not too sure. I know there are stratolites uh, in in WA off the coast of northern WA. I don't know their age, George. Unfortunately, I couldn't tell you whether they're Cambrian or not. Sorry, uh, I haven't touched the Cambrian stuff, and I was I was working on these sort of uh, frond-like organisms, uh, not stratolites as well. So. Uh, sorry, George, I don't really know the answer. All right. Uh, I think that's, that's all we got here. 
Um, well, wonderful. Well, thanks for having me. Thank you so much for coming. I enjoyed it a lot. Good. I think everybody enjoyed it. Um, and thank you, Tim, for sharing your knowledge and expertise with us. Uh, I love about the, what, another thing I love about this story is that it it um, one, it's a small museum. We are a small museum. Uh, there's wonderful uh, discoveries yet to be made and the importance of natural history museums. It just highlights that again. And it also um, talks about the discoveries are not just made by scientists. Um, it, most discoveries in the natural history world and natural world are made by people who are just out there looking. Yeah. So you yeah. don't have yeah. to have any credentials behind your name. You just have to be um, out there observing the world and getting involved. Um, and, and citizen science projects uh, are a great way to do that. But just getting out there, um, you just because you're an amateur doesn't mean that there's there's you cannot make a big discovery. Most discoveries are made by quote unquote amateurs. Yeah. No, I agree. Here, here. So, um, yeah, definitely a lot of the material at Chronosaurus Corner wouldn't exist if it wasn't for citizen science and those projects like the Big Dig and and things like that. So, um, yeah, I think it's it's a it's always been an important part of paleontology um, and it continues to be. So, well, thank you guys. Thank you, and thank you, Lance, for bringing um, yes. things to us. Thank you, Lance. Yeah. And I uh, hope to see y'all soon uh, online and in person. Come, come, come see us at the museum and come see what we have um, as well. And then maybe we could do a field trip and go uh, go fossil hunting out uh, out by you, Tim. Yeah, sorry. Yes, oh, sorry. Yeah, we kind of went in and out, but yes, definitely, definitely. And I'll be sure if I'm in. I've only been through Baltimore once, but uh, next time I'm I'm in Maryland, I will pop in and say hello so yeah you must do that i will promise yeah all right okay well thank you all i'm gonna head off i need to go and i've got a lecture in 35 minutes so. okay take care <laughs> have a good day i will bye bye thank you all for coming thanks so much bye 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 bye, -bye. bye.